Thank you so much. I hope all of you can see me and all of you can hear me. I'm just going to get to the poem we need to um, discuss tonight. Um, we are doing to learn how to speak. Um, I hope you can see that online. Um, let me just go to one more document and then we are good to go. Okay, here we go. Is this the one? Is this where I need to be? Oh, yeah, there we go. Thank you. We are on page 31. If you are ready, I'm going to start. Just give me a minute. I'm so sorry. Okay. Let's see. Let's, let's do that. Okay, to learn how to speak, here we go. To learn how to speak with the voices of the land, to pass the speech in its rivers, to catch in the inarticulate grunt, stammer, call, cry, babble, tongues not, a sense of the stoniness of these stones, from which all words are cut, to trace with a tongue wagon trail, saying the suffix, suffix means uh, a portion of the word at the back of it, so if you have a word like um, water, no, let's see, watered, ed would be the, the suffix. If you say watered, they watered the garden. So saying the suffix of the aches in kale, pun, fontaine, in watery names that confirm the dryness of their ways. To visit the places of occlusion or the leak in a flay bunk door. To bury my mouth in the pit of your arm, in that planetarium. <coughs> Sorry. Pectoral beginning to the nub of time. Down there, close to the water table, to feel the moon as it drums at the back of my throat, its cow skin vow. Let's do this again. We're going to come back here. I first want to have a look at the words in order for you to, to have a better understanding if there's any words that seem to be strange to you explanation of words when we use the word pass in this poem it means analyze a sentence into different parts inarticulate not able to express when you can articulate you're able to express adequately or clearly then the word stammer is when someone stammers it's, it's like to speak um, with pauses and to repeat maybe the first letters of words when you babble it's confused talk or thoughtlessness um, we've discussed what the word suffix is um, occlusion means something is closed up or blocked something is blocked when it's occluded um, leak in this instance refers to um, salt leak a place where animals go to leak mineral salt from the ground Flay bunk is the edge of a shallow pool of water. Pit is a large hole in the ground. There's the word planetarium, a building in which images of stars, planets, and constellations are projected onto a curved ceiling. Pectoral, having to do with the breast, your pecs, or chest. Nub is a small lump. Then we have the word vowel. We all know what vowels are. Five vowels in the alphabet. A E I O U. Stompy refers to a cigarette, I'm sure you're familiar with that term here in South Africa. Stick fast means fast in Afrikaans, meaning to become stuck. Uh, Golovan is a small truck pushed. A Golovan is a small truck pushed in rails in mines to carry oars. Shongololo is a man legged worm like creature which rolls up um, into a ball if it is threatened. 
There's the word boom bang. Boom bang is just like that. The word inflections can mean both the way that someone says a word, depending on where the emphasis is, or a grammatical change in the form of the word. So let's say we talk about the word apple, apple, and then we'll say appeal. Can you see it's called inflection? And the moment that changes, it means this, as the sound changes, the meaning changes of the word. Um, syllables we are familiar with, it's units of pronunciation. Um, so if you say man, there's two syllables in there. The word chant, I'm sure we are familiar with it because that's what we do when we toy toy. Everyone sings as a group or they say certain phrases repeatedly. Then there is the resolve, there is the resolve of, a, of, a, of a, what is your resolve of a situation? Or what was the outcome or the determination? What have you determined by means of your action? What was your resolve to a problem? Okay, now let's go back to the poem and see if it makes any sense. Now sort of having an idea of what, what those words mean. To learn how to speak with the voices of the land to pass. We just saw the word pass, what it means. Um, it means to dissect. Okay? To analyze a sentence into different parts, to dissect it that way. Then to catch the inarticulate grant, in other words, that which we can't articulate or can't clarify. Stammer, call, cry, babble, tongues not. It seems like we're talking about a language that is being created. And so as a baby stammers, a baby cries, a baby calls, he babbles, his tongue is nothing. There's a sense of the stoniness of these stones. In other words, when we talk about how hard these stones are and how old stones are, from which all words are cut. Remember that in the old stone age, they used to cut out words on stones. Now it says to train with the tongue wagon trails. In other words, we're talking about the Khruat trek and, and how the farmers of those days um, used to, um, to, to trek really or to move along with wagons, wagon trails. So you're tracing those wagon trails. Now, and then you're saying the suffixes of the X. So where they, where they um, I always want to say where they passed, they had, let's just say, Neuensfontein, they had Brakpan, um, and they use those words, those suffixes at the back of those words. Um, Bloemfontein is one of those words. In watery names that confirm the dryness of their ways, in other words, they were dr these were dry people, they were unimaginative people, or un um, n not creative, un I'd say uncreative, they're not creative in certain ways. They visit the, the visit, they visited the places of occlusion, in other words, those places that were blocked up and then they started opening it up. Or the leak in a flaybunk dawn, to bury my mouth in the pit of your arm, in that planetarium, pectoral beginning. In other words, they are now saying, this, they're saying, um, I found a, a nice warm place in the pit of your arm. And he, he then... It's a metaphor in this instance when he says in that planetarium, because the planetarium is a, a, a building which is, I want to say, a starry skies up there. And so he finds a nice um, place that is sort of a breakaway. Is that what you want to call Like Almost like um, he's in a fairy land this time. Starry skies he finds in the pit of someone or his beloved's arm. Down there, close to the water table, to feel the full moon as it drums at the back of my throat, its cow-skinned vow. To write a poem with words like, I'm telling you, stompy, stick fast. Now he's starting to use words that the ordinary person on the, on the street is using. It's, it's, a, it's words and it's language that is created by the people. To understand the least inflections, we spoke about that where we put the emphasis on different parts of the word and the moment it's used differently he starts to understand those infliction, inflections to voice without swallowing syllables born in tin shacks that's, that's very interesting he's saying I want to voice those the language without swallowing it the, the syllables so sometimes when you learn a new language you don't know where to put those syllables. You don't know. You're swallowing your words. 
um, born in tin shacks. Again, the, the language that is born and the, and the inflections that are born in the shacks. Or to catch the 5.15 in quarter past 5. That means quarter past 5. 5.15 in quarter past 5. That's the way people use the language on the street in tin shacks. The Chuanisburg train. Um, to reach the low chant of the mine gangs. In other words, in the, ga in the mines, the gangs that are using there, and that's not referring necessarily to gangs, but rather to the men, the groups of men working in, in mines. Now he's saying the low chant, the, the, the way they sing together in mines. Mineral glow of people and un, 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 unbreakable result. When we talk about the mineral glow of our people, we could say that the glow of our people are like minerals, but that in itself, for instance, is a metaphor because we are now comparing the glow and the resolve of the people to the mineral glow in the minds. Then in the end, he says, to learn how to speak with the voices of this land. In other words, he wants to get to know the voices, the, the language. Of the people. No. <laughs> I don't know, Sunni's just talking to me. Why? Because I don't even want to touch you. It's in hand, my seat. Sorry, my phone is talking to me. I don't know what is happening. I think she needs my attention. She, might, I might have left her alone for too long, and it's very unusual for. Her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's go. Let's analyze the poem as we go along. Now that we have a general idea of what what it is saying, I think that this is important to note the background of the of or the history of the poet, so that we understand in what context it was written. Jeremy Cronin was born in Cape Town in 1949. In 1968, he started his studies at the University of Cape Town. They joined the Band South African Communist Party, or the SACP. He did postgraduate studies in France and returned to UCT as a lecturer in philosophy. He was arrested by the South African Security Police for his anti-state activity and sentenced in 1976 to seven years in jail for treason. Now, his wife, Annie Marie, died, Anne -Marie died, died while he was in jail. And so this could refer to when he talks about the planetarium of her armpit, how he longs for that and how he felt that warmth with her. After his release, um, pressure from the security police formed him into, forced him into exile in 1987. He returned to South Africa after the unbanning of the ANC and the SACP. Since then, he has, then he has occupied a range of political positions. Um, he was the deputy minister of public works. And so uh, it sort of gives you an indication that he was out of the country when he came back into the country the language and the people might have developed and that's why he yearns to speak with the, with the languages um, of the land, the language that the people use, that the people use on the street, the people use, wants to write poetry um, uh, with the language that are being used in the minds that are, are, that's being used on the streets. Let's quickly go through what the theme of this, of this poem is. The explicit message is on the next page. The explicit message of the poem is the desire of the poet, is the desire the poet has to learn to speak a language that comes from the land and all its people. That is it in a nutshell. He learns to he yearns to speak a language that comes from the land and all its people. Ultimately, he wants to write poetry that is based on this language, a poetry that will be influenced by the language of the masses and understood by the masses. So it is poetry by the people, for the people, so that they understand it, and in particular the black working class, 
language is understood in the poem both literally and figuratively let's talk about that quickly literally in terms of the words we use to communicate but also figuratively meaning a shared understanding language is used in this instance um, and built up um, by means of the of the words that we use literally and to figuratively meaning a shared understanding sometimes we don't understand the words or the, the definition of words but there's a shared understanding of how we communicate with and to each other the poem, poem encourages all south africans to find a common language a way of understanding each other we must never again allow the language or worldview of one community to be forced upon the diverse communities that make up this nation what what is he saying he's saying we are a diverse community we have diverse communities in this country and we should not allow one language or one worldview to dominate us or that that worldview of that one community is forced upon the diversity uh, we get to enjoy in South Africa. Let's summarize. This, what, what is going to follow is an attempt to summarize the poem because we find this, this poem to be very complex, complex really. Um, and you can't actually summarize it without any accuracy, as you'll see, because he's talking about this, that, and the other. He's going through, I also want to say, time lapses of, of the Stone Age and how we struggle to have, uh, to have formed words, how we struggle to develop this language. And then he also talks about the physical environments that, um, that we went through as a country. Let's go. In lines one to two, the poet indicates that he wants to learn to speak with all the voices of South Africa. He wants to speak about the physical environment of this country in line three. Then in lines four to seven, the prehistoric people in Southern Africa is communicated. How they communicated um, on stones and through stones and, and pictures they drew and words they formed by means of, of the struggles. He talks about the struggle of the 19th century Afrikaners as they trekked inland in lines 8 to 11. He talks about the shutting down of voices in the apartheid South Africa and how to experience again the liberating joy of intimacy with one he loves. Why is he referring to that? Because he was removed from his wife. Um, so he was in exile and then he wants to experience again that intimacy when he talks about her armpit. How to write a poem in a language that the masses of South Africa can understand and which can help him understand their experiences from line 21 to 30. He's saying the following, I want to be able to write with the language of the people and he wants to be able to understood these experiences. Again, how to speak with all the voices of, of South Africa is again um, emphasized in lines 32 to 33. Here's the type and form of this poem. This poem is a lyrical poem. In a lyrical poem, you almost, you, a story is being told. Number two, in most instances when free verse is being used, um, we would use certain poetic devices to connect the poem. So in this instance, and in most instances of the lyrical poem, you will find um, repetition. In this particular poem, we, we, call, we call it the refrain. Um, so it would read, to learn how to speak, to do this, to be able to do this and the other. Then they also make use of um, what we call the infinitive phrase construction. Um, I'm not too sure if I've covered it with you in paper one, but I did, I did allude to this last week when we got together. What is the infinitive? What is the finite verb? And what is the infinite verb? So your finite verb would be all the verbs in a sentence. Finite. But your infinite verb, remember I said let's make it infinito. So, the infinite verb would be all the verbs that appear after the word to. And you will see in this particular poem, it says to learn, to learn, to learn how to speak. 
to learn to speak with a with a um, language on this, of the street. So let's read this. In addition to the refrain, the infinitive phrase to plus the verb is used on twelve se separate occasions. Why? Each infinitive phrase introduces a new idea or adds to our understanding of an existing idea. So every single time he says to learn, he's saying, I want to learn something new. Or I there's a new concept or a new idea that is being introduced to me. And so it adds to my understanding or it adds to the understanding of an existing idea. So every single time the infinitive is used, it is used to introduce a new idea or a new concept that he needs to learn and understand. There we go. Let's go from line 1 to 13 and then work our way through. So you can actually compartmentalize the, the poem from in these particular sections. Lines 1 to 13. Note how the poem starts with an infinitive phrase to learn we just discussed it. In order to make sense of the infinitive phrases in this poem, you need to understand that they have come after a subject and verb that have, that have not been expressed. So when you read the poem, keep in mind that the poet means I want to or I need to learn how to speak, for example. In line 3, next page, the poet uses the river as a symbol of the physical environment. Remember one of the things when we summarized the poem, we said he wanted to learn the language and to, he wanted to get to know the physical environment. And so he uses the river as a symbol of the physical environment. He means I need to get to know the physical environment of this country. In lines 4 to 7, he says he wants to use the sounds made by animals and those people who struggle to speak in order to get a sense of the way Stone Age people first try to communicate. If you listen to the Khoi people speaking, it would be like sounds that they create. And so he says, I want to get to know these sounds in order to understand it. In line 6 to 7, there's a metaphor. The words cut from stone refers to the theory that prehistoric language arose from early human kinds struggle against the physical environment. So there was a struggle against the physical environment. Why would that be? Because as much as language has not been developed way back then, that's how underdeveloped um, humankind has been, the human race has been. So there was no development and the struggle was always against the physical environment. In lines 8 to 11, the poet wants to learn of the hardships. Remember we talk about wagon trails, the hardships of the African trekkers what they experienced and he's doing that by saying aloud the names they gave to places they passed by or settled. The suffixes Fontaine, Pan, in names like Bloemfontein or Verneer Pan, tells of the struggle. Can you hear those words? Bloemfontein, so it could have been that there was a that diploma of Bloemet. It could be that he was Verneer there. He was cheated there at Verneerpan. Now, those names with those suffixes, <coughs> I'm so sorry, so sorry, tells of their struggle to find water in a dry land. A fontaine is a small water source. A pan is a shallow pool of water that dries up in the dry season. So here, here you can see, they can ask you, what's the difference between a fontaine and a pan? Fontaine is a small water source. A pan or pan is a small pool of water that dries up in the dry season, leaving a salt deposit. In line 11, the dryness of their ways can be understood to have more than one meaning. Okay, dryness of their ways. Besides the literal meaning, the environment was dry. That's literally. It could also suggest that the trekkers were God-fearing. There we go. 
but unimaginative people. So when they talk about the dryness of their ways, one, it is understood um, that there could be a literal meaning, the environment was dry, and two, they, they, their characters were dry, the characteristics they possessed were dry, they were dry people or unimaginative people. Lines 12 to 13. Um, we're talking about, in those lines, about the word occl occlusion. Occlusion means closing up. It could refer to the difficulty of communicating. Have you ever stood in front of maybe a panel of people or maybe you needed to do a, rep a, a presentation and suddenly it's difficult for you to communicate, like you clog up really. So this is what is meant by the word occlusion. Um, the flaybunk image links up with other words about water in this poem. Um, it also, there's the word lick, lick. It reminds us also of the tongue which we use when you, we communicate. So this poem is really about communicating. And now we close up and then there's the lick as well. It talks about the dryness of the pun. It talks about the saltiness thereof and how we communicate and how we dry up as, uh, as communicators at times but also as poets who are trying to write um, poetry. Let's go to the next section. It's in, we find it in lines 14 to 20. In lines 14 to 20, uh, this could be interpreted as talking about intimacy with a loved one. The poet uses another word related to water. It's called the water table. What does it suggest? suggests much more depth than the pun or the flay. So when we talk about the water table, we're not only referring to the pan or the pun, which is, is almost just a small shallow um, bit of water. It's, it's more than just the flay that can dry up. So in line 14, he asks to learn how to bury his mouth in the pit of your arm um, or the armpit. This line suggests real, what, what is meant by that? That's what you want to ask. It suggests a real longing for another person. We must remember when the poem was composed, he had been separated from his wife for years by imprisonment. The language is very figurative. It's not literal, really. The pit of our arm becomes a planetarium, a curved ceiling onto which images of stars, suns, moons, and planets are projected. The metaphor, what's the function thereof? suggests that a physical, this is what you want to underline and remember, a physical and emotional intimacy with this person set him free. And then, why are we talking about setting him free? Because remember, he was in exile. So when you compare the openness of the universe, the planetarium, with the closeness, that's what, is that the word I want to use? Um, how closed up he was in a cramped up prison cell. So they're comparing the openness of the planetarium or the universe with the narrowness of a cramped prison cell. At the same time, the pectoral or chest muscles that start from under the arm take him downward to the nub of time. What is he referring to? He's speaking figuratively. It's taking him down into the earth to the water table. There's a water table in the earth. Or, or I want to say in in the core of the earth. Does going deeper in this poem mean getting closer to the truth of what is real? Is that what he's trying to say? But that's the figurative meaning. Lines 14 to 20 could also be interpreted in a different way. As talking about his need to connect with the earth and his origins of humankind. So, okay, it can refer to his need to connect to the earth. Lines 18 to 20. The poet says he wants to feel the full moon. Remember, he cannot see it because he's in the prison cell. Just by uttering the word aloud, feeling the vowel sound vibrate in his throat, moon, like the cow skin surface of a drum. This image of the drum is a symbol of African culture and takes us into the final part of this poem. Okay, let's talk about lines. 21 to 23. I just want to repeat that. The image of the drum he's using is a symbol of African culture and takes us into the final part of the poem. So about lines 21 to 33. He starts the section by making clear that he wants to learn to write a poem 
using the language of ordinary people with disgust them, the masses of South Africans. Lines 22 to 24, he gives um, examples of words and expression of this language. He wants to learn to be able to hear the slightest difference in meaning suggested by the words that are uttered. So he wants to be able to understand that the difference in meanings when people speak aloud. And he wants to speak the language of ordinary people properly without swallowing those syllables. Um, and he wants to be able to pronounce them correctly. He needs to learn this language so that he can talk like them, even in his imagination. He travels, when you travel to work with them. Remember, we he, he mentions the quarter past five um, bus. And join them deep down in the earth in the mine shafts where the chanting is happening. The low chant of, chant of the miners hints at where the unbreakable resolve of the common people of South Africa came from in the mines and they kept on chanting there. To chant means to sing in unison and the strength of the common people during the era of apartheid came from this, from doing things together. So what, what does it mean when we chant together? It also indicates that we were doing things together and that our um, strength as a people, our resolve as a people came from the, our power in numbers. And remember they refer to the mind gangs. So they ganged up, there's power in numbers. This is his wish, to learn to speak to the ordinary people in their everyday language and so become one with them. Let's quickly look at the tone of this poem. The tone of the poem is deeply thoughtful. In other words, it is reflective, intensely serious and sincere. The tone of this poem is deeply thoughtful, intensely serious and sincere. That, in a nutshell, is to learn how to speak. What is it that you are trying? That you are learning. You're learning the language of the people. You're trying to write poetry um, in the language of the people that is created by the people. You're trying to learn the inflections and the way people use language, and then write poetry for the people. Then you're also trying to learn um, the physical environment. Learn more about the physical environment. Of this country, um, how names were formed, and and um, how significant it is, the suffixes that we have um, that we created, and what it means to say Brakpan or Fernirpan or Bloemfontein, and then talk. We also want to learn about the people, the food trekkers, um, the, the 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 Afrikaners, the prehistoric language before that. And how humankind developed its language on stone and in the stone age. There we go. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, I hope this helped you a bit. If you have any questions, please feel free um, to send me um, your questions on the WhatsApp text. Um, I can always attend to it when I have time. Um, but I will get back to you. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye.